there is no better way to understand the inner workings of a CPU than by emulating it, right? I have already built my own computer in real hardware here. It's called the Minimal UR CPU and it's about as powerful as an Apple One. It doesn't use an integrated CPU but is built entirely out of TTL chips. If you want to learn more about its minimalistic design, check out my other videos here on my channel. Today I'll attempt to write a CycleExact real-time emulator for this system in C++ in about 250 lines of code. I'll paste little code blocks every now and then and try to explain what's going on as good as I can. But please note that this is not going to be a C++ tutorial, so you should be familiar with language features like vectors and shared pointers. I have prepared this code here in Notepad++. Let's just start with this infinite main loop of our application and see if we can compile it. I am using G++ within the msys2 environment, which I really like a lot. Let's compile with G++ main.cpp. Dash capital OS optimizes for size and dash S strips all symbols from the executable. Let's run it. Okay, now before we do anything else, let's quickly implement keyboard input. I am trying an NC control sequence here. That should clear the screen. Hmm, but it doesn't. That's because Windows consoles by default ignore these NC sequences. Let's switch our application to NC mode and try again. Yeah, okay, that looks better now. We will forward most keystrokes to the CPU later, but I plan to use the end key to quit the application and the position 1 key to reset the CPU. To find out what codes we need to be looking for, let's print out the key codes rather than the characters. Now if I press an A we get the normal ASCII code 97. Now I am pressing the end key and we get this strange double output starting with a minus 32. Same for position 1 but with a different second number. So to detect the special keys, our final keyboard handler needs to keep track of the last pressed key to know if it was a minus 32. Okay, that's looking good. We can detect reset and quit. In the schematic overview of the CPU, we see five different modules that are connected to an 8-bit data bus. Some modules also have direct interconnections to other modules like the RAM and its address register, or the adder with its A and B registers. A module is activated by its control signals, shown in yellow, coming from the control logic. Many of the modules are just registers or counters, holding or incrementing a single value. All actions are synchronized by a common system clock. Let us see how each module type acts while working our way through a clock cycle. With the falling edge, we see the control logic updating the control signals of all other components. Reaching the low state, a selected component may output its content to the bus. Hence you see the control signals A register out, E out for sum out, RAM out and terminal register out. Upon the rising edge of the clock, a component may either sample the bus or increment its current value. And while the clock remains high, we again see the adder updating and potentially outputting its result to the bus. This is because the adder is working asynchronously. And as a last step, storing the bus's value in RAM or in the terminal register for transmission via UART also happen asynchronously and consequently will always hold the latest bus value. But how does the control logic generate all the control signals in the right order? As a universal first step, the CPU loads a byte from the program counter's RAM address into the instruction register. Then the CPU sort of knows its instruction and will output the associated control signals. These control patterns are hard-coded as so-called microcode and are stored in the control ROM. But after power-up, there usually is no program in RAM. 
Well, therefore, the operating system is also stored in a small ROM. In real hardware, these data are stored in EEPROMs. Our emulator will have to read in and use these corresponding ROM images. Ok, now we can start working. Let's implement a computer class with reset, update and input function. And a component class, defining the actions during a clock cycle. I set all of components functions virtual, so that they can be overwritten when we derive our modules from it later. Ok, let's now create a computer instance and manage it from within our application. Let's reset our computer. And give him some input. And we update our computer every 10 milliseconds. Ok, now we need to think about the update function. Let's measure when we updated last time. I'm using this uh, get tick counts function within Windows. Calculating the simulated time here. If it's larger than the duration of a clock cycle, let's simulate one clock cycle. Ok, now that we have components, we can manage them within our computer class. The computer will use a vector of shared pointers to its components. This way we can pass a component pointer around to another component that needs access to it. And when we reset the computer, we simply reset all the components. And when we update our computer, we update all components over a clock cycle. Ok, we have everything in place to handle a computer and its components. But our computer at this stage doesn't have any. We haven't even specified what each component should do. Let's begin by analyzing the register counter implementation. A register is derived from the component class. And it overrides the functions reset, being low and rising edge. Let's take a look at its member variables first. A register stores a 16-bit value mStore and holds references to its IO port and control word. For each of its actions, input, output, increment and MSB LSB selection, it uses a bit mask to determine whether an action is enabled by the control word or not. Its two main functions are actually really simple. While the clock being low, it outputs either its stored LSB or MSB to its IO port if activated. And upon the rising edge, it may either read a value from the bus or increment its stored value. And that's really all. Next comes the adder, which calculates the sum of the two registers A and B and sets the zero carry and negative flags accordingly. Our adder also features a carry in control signal and can invert B for subtraction. Remember, subtracting in two's complement is just adding the inverse plus one. Hence we see two new member variables here. Shared pointers to the registers A and B and a reference to some flag output lines. At the start of a clock cycle, the adder reads out A and B and depending on the control signal ES inverts B. Then we calculate the result A plus B plus carry in and set the flags accordingly. And in case sum out is active, we put the result onto the bus. As I've mentioned earlier, the same operation is also performed during the high phase of the clock. Now we do the memory, which includes ROM and UART for simplicity, since it is memory mapped anyway. 
we see three new member variables here. A shared pointer to the memory address register, a 32k array and a reference to the input buffer of our CPU. While the clock is low, if activated, we do the following. If the memory address is hex 8000 or above, we output a character from the input buffer. Or else we put a value stored in memory onto the bus. And during the high clock phase, we either move the bus value into memory or into the console output stream. And that's really it. Finally, we implement the control logic of our CPU. It needs shared pointer access to three registers, the step counter, the instruction register and the flex register, and will output the current control word from its microcode array here. The control lines are set at the falling edge of the clock, right at the beginning of a cycle. Mm, but there are two special cases to consider here. In case we encounter instruction register clear, the step counter is reset and a new control word is outputted immediately. This happens because in real hardware, IC forces an immediate reset of the step counter too. As a special feature of the CPU architecture, the bus lines are pulled high if nothing else is controlling them. And the most significant bit is directly pulled by the high control signal. Whew! Now that we've all module types implemented, let's use them to build our CPU bit by bit. With all the hard work out of the way now, this should be quite straightforward. It is time to specify which bit of our control word corresponds to which control signal. I'm just pasting this here. This is somewhat arbitrary, of course. I stick to how I've built the actual hardware. Down here you see the definition of an act low mask. A set bit identifies a control signal as active low on the real hardware. Anyway, it'll let us interpret the microcode correctly when we read it in. Now, before we add any components to our computer, let's add the bus lines, control lines and flag lines. Inside the constructor of our CPU, let's begin by creating the A register as an example. All the other registers are kind of similar. A's port is just the bus and it gets access to the control word and we specify its control signals A in and at A out. Now I do the instruction, flags and step registers. Note that the flags registers port is not the bus but the flag lines. I again adapt this for the program counter and the memory address register. For the control logic we change the module type and hand over access to the appropriate registers we've already created here. And finally, we do the same thing for the adder and ram. Okay. Now that we have created all components and interconnections, we can push their pointers into our component array. Our handler will automatically take care of them. The beauty of using shared pointers here is that our components will live as long as their ref count is non-zero. Ok, our computer should be complete now, except for the control ROM and system ROM still being empty. But before we proceed any further here, it seems about the right time to check for compile errors. Whoa, that looks catastrophic, but I think I already know what I forgot. Let's check for the first error though. Ah, I've used the wrong variable name here. I forgot to include the headers for vectors in shared pointers. 
and we can include file io too let's try again okay looks much better now <laughs> only one more yeah we have another misspelled variable here and i think i forgot to define m sim time too that should be a float let's compile again yeah this time the code compiles just fine let's start our cpu well it does but without proper microcode and rom nothing's gonna happen here as our final step we load the corresponding images in the constructors of the control logic and the memory you see me pasting these code blocks here since i think file io is always a bit boring just one more thing, we need to use our bit invert mask actlow here to interpret the microcode data correctly, as I've mentioned earlier. Now we copy the files into our folder. Let me quickly check how many lines I've used. Ah, just above 250. I'll clean things up a bit just to get it down to 250. That was close, but we did it. Everything is in place now and we can give it a go. Let's keep fingers crossed when we compile and fire up the system. And yes, the system boots into its little monitor. Let's see if we can use it like the original and play Tetris again. Forgive me for reusing this game so often. If you get bored, I'll be totally blown away if you could provide a better game for this architecture. Of course, you could use the existing cross-compiler to write and upload software to the emulator, just like on the real hardware. I'll include the little assembler in my project repository, along with the other files. The link is in the description. Let us again assemble and upload a file just to see everything is working as it should. And this is it for today. Congratulations if you are still watching and if you have been following the whole journey. I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I did and that you got something out of it. Take care. Bye.